Welcome to our overview this week of LifeWays Explore the Bible Sunday School lesson of Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 16, with the title of Calling for Sunday, August 4th, 2024. A way that you could begin this lesson would be to share that in 1997, Rosaria Champagne Butterfield was a liberal lesbian college professor who was researching the Bible to write an article against the religious right. After she published the article, she got a lot of mail, pro and con, but one stuck out to her from a local pastor, Ken Smith, who asked her some sincere questions about her presuppositions about the Bible. He invited her to have dinner with him and his wife, and they began a long process of loving her, ministering to her, answering questions. And to make a long story short, two years later, she gave her life to Jesus as her Lord and Savior, and she is now the wife of a Presbyterian pastor in North Carolina. She wrote an amazing book about the process of her conversion. I consider it to be one of the best books I've read because it's so insightful about the, the thought processes, what a person's thinking when God is working in them and how he spoke to her and changed her life. Title of her book is The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. Rosaria Butterfield, liberal lesbian college professor, was definitely an unlikely convert. Then you, if you want to share that story, then ask your group, can you share the story of another unlikely convert that you know or read about somebody who came to the Lord? Of course, there are so many, including Chuck Colson, C.S. Lewis, Anthony Flew, the atheist debater who famously became a believer in God and, and possibly a Christian, wrote the book, There is a God, and others that, uh, that, that you all can share. Then say something like today, we're going to look at the story of one of the most unlikely men who ever was saved, Saul of Tarsus, who actually had been persecuting Christians, but uh, God dramatically saved and changed him. Context, of course, we're continuing our study through the book of Acts. We've seen that Acts, in many ways, is the story of how the early church continued to spread the gospel, overcoming barriers and difficulties, both outward persecution and inward challenges of dissension and hypocrisy. We saw how the church began the deacon ministry to address the needs of widows, and the new deacons, Stephen and Philip, shared the word. After Stephen was martyred for sharing his faith, Acts 1 says, on that day a great persecution began against the church, and it says they were all scattered. See, God used even this persecution to scatter the disciples so their witness would go all over the world, as verse 4 indicates. Verse 3 says, but Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Again, we see another characteristic of Luke's writing, uh, how he, he will briefly introduce a character, almost in passing, who later on is going to grow into a much larger role. We saw that with Barnabas in Acts 5. Now we see it again with Saul, who will become Paul. So that brings us now to Acts chapter 9, and the story of God's miraculous uh, salvation of the Apostle Paul and his call in his life, and it ought to get us to consider our call as well. For an outline this week, uh, you know, it, it's been taught that a good outline for a testimony is to share what your life was before you came to Christ, how you came to know Christ, and then what your life has been like since you came to Christ. It's a good outline for testimony, and I plan to use a similar outline for this lesson with a little addition uh, for the Lord's instructions to Ananias in uh, verses 10 through 14. So my outline is going to be something like this. Point number one, Saul before Christ, chapter 9, verses 1 and, and 2. Point two, Saul meets Christ, verses 3 through 9. Ananias calling to serve or minister, disciple Paul in verses 10 through 14. Then finally, uh, Saul's calling after Christ, verses 15 and 16. And then you may want to call it point five, whether you just want to call it an application, preparing your testimony. And I hope you'll strongly consider doing something like this in the lesson this week. We'll get to that in just a bit. So our text this week, point number one, Saul before Christ. We see it in verses uh, one and two. Is at the end of Acts 7, we see how Stephen was stoned. Uh, when he was stoned, the persecutors laid their robes at the feet of Saul. Then when the persecution breaks out after that, verse 3 says, it was Saul who began ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women. He, he put them in prison. Now in, in chapter 9, we see this is still going on. Verse 1 says, now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So you might ask your group, what all do you see in this passage about Saul before he came to the Lord? You can either ask your group for it or just lecture on these points. Several things here. It says still. Uh, he hadn't cooled down any. He was still very actively persecuting the Christians, uh, which he'd started when Stephen was killed. It says he was breathing threats and, and murder. So it wasn't just like he was posting insults on Twitter, right? 
I mean, he, he was really persecuting Christians. He was threatening to murder them and, and had evidently led in murdering Stephen. So he was no idle threat. Then verse 2, and notice it says he asked for letters from the high priest to the synagogue at Damascus. So you might uh, get a map of uh, the, the area and just show your class where Damascus is, uh, well north of, uh, of Israel there, and make the point, look how far uh, Saul was going to persecute the new Christians. Damascus is 135 miles in the air, but it's really closer to 200 miles with the route that you have to take to get there. Uh, that is a long way, especially in biblical times. I mean, if, if you went 20 or 30 miles a day, it, it's something like a week's travel uh, to just so you could get and persecute some more of these people. I mean, it, it just demonstrates how zealous he was in his persecution of the followers of Christ. It wasn't enough just to hound them in Jerusalem. He had to make a, a week's travel uh, to go get even more of them. And then I think it's of note, the text specifically says he would take both men and women. He had no extra compassion on women. He took them as well. He was a real hardliner. Then it says he wanted to bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he would uh, have them tied up or put in chains. He wanted to bring them to Jerusalem where they could be tried and punished, and uh, sometimes put to death, uh, as we'll see, uh, or, or just, just put in prison, like uh, chapter 8, verse 3 says. Paul shares some more about his uh, pre-Christ days and his testimony in Acts 26. I'm going to mention this later. Uh, his testimony, Paul's testimony, is actually shared three times in the book of Acts. Here, and again in Acts 22, and again in Acts 26. just shows us how important the Lord felt his story was. But he says in Acts 26, 10, and 11, This is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, uh, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they are being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them uh, often in, in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. So th this kind of expands on that a little bit. Gives us quite a sketch of just how zealous Paul was in his persecution of the Lord's people. This is no half-hearted guy. He led the fight against Christianity. He was giving everything he had to stop this new faith, which makes it, of course, even more dramatic how God changed him. So this was Paul B.C., before Christ. Now, if you didn't do it in the introduction, you might discuss others you know whose lives are greatly changed from before Christ. But then especially help your group to apply this personally and ask them, what was your life like before you came to Christ? What are some things that have changed? And you and your group can share some, some things that are different in your life. Now, I know that many of our class members may have come to Christ at a young age, and they may not have that much to share at this point. You, you might consider using this following uh, so that they won't feel uh, badly about that. Someone said uh, that coming to Christ as an adult after a whole life of, of rebelling against him is like crossing a great river at its widest point. I think of the Mississippi, which I've driven across many times. It, it's so wide. But while we all do have to cross the river of salvation, when we come to Christ as a child, it's more like crossing that same river way upstream when it's just a little brook that you can just hop across. It's not as big, it's not as dramatic, but you still did cross the same river. I, I think this illustration can help a lot of Christians who may kind of feel bad that they don't have a dramatic testimony like Paul and, and so many others. They shouldn't. There is so much to be thankful for if you had a godly upbringing. And if sharing this illustration may help some of your class members, I hope you'll do that. Then you might also include this question uh, in, uh, under this point. What does this tell us about some people we know today that we are praying for who seem to be so radically against Christ? Of course, the answer is this gives us hope that they too can be changed, right? Nothing's too difficult for the Lord. If he can save Saul, the, the primary persecutor of Christianity, if he can save Rosaria Butterfield, a liberal lesbian college professor, that he can save that person you are praying for right now too. So don't stop praying. Don't stop sharing. So that, that was Saul before Christ. And there's some, some good applications for us there too. Then secondly, we see Saul meets Christ, verses 3 through 9. Again, to get, get my group involved with this text, I, I plan to ask them, listen while I read this, and then share what stands out to you in Paul's encounter with Christ in these verses. Here's, of course, the, the verses. It says, as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Lord. 
And he said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus and he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. So I ask you, what, what, what do y'all see here in these points? See, you could just lecture on these two, but uh, I, would, I would share the following to make sure this was, was discussed. That this happened, first of all, while he was approaching Damascus. So he was well along the way in the journey uh, when this happened. And it says it happened suddenly. I've read where some contemporary scholars have tried to explain this away as some astrological sign, astronomical sign in the heavens or something like that. It doesn't fit the story of what happened in the text at all. It says it was suddenly. It says it was a light from heaven that flashed around him. If it was like anything natural, it was more like a lightning flash. But as we'll see, it lasted much longer. And then what did Saul do? It says he fell to the ground. And he heard a voice, and, and it was Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In verse 5, he asks who this is, and, and he tells him it's Jesus. In verse 6, he commands him to go into the city, Damascus, so which they were very close to at this point. And significantly, uh, the Lord says to him, it will be told you what you must do. Right off the bat here, Jesus shows him that he is going to be his Lord. He's going to be giving him orders, which he's now going to follow for the rest of his life. We and uh, those that, that we would share with need to realize Jesus does not just come into our lives to, to save us from our sins, but also to be the Lord, the master, the boss of our lives. He's not just our Savior, he's also our Lord. And in Scripture, it is always in this order. When the words Lord and Savior are used together, it is always Lord and Savior. Lord first. Christ told the Saul what he's going to do, and uh, he was going to obey him, and he will tell us what we're going to do as well. He comes into our lives as Lord, just like he did into Saul's life. Then verses 7 and 8 give us some interesting tidbits. Verse 7 says the other man in his party heard the voice, but they didn't see Jesus. Only Paul saw Jesus. Of course, that's one condition of an apostle, being a witness to Jesus' resurrection. But the others did hear it. So they could corroborate. He was not making this episode up. They were witnesses to the truth of what had happened. And verse 8 indicates that after this, Saul couldn't see. And verse 9 says he didn't eat or drink anything for three days afterwards. I think it might be an interesting dis discussion question to ask your group. Why do you think he didn't eat or drink anything for three days? See, see, what, see what they might share. Of course, a couple ideas here. Uh, of course, it was a very traumatic event. I mean, almost being like almost being hit by lightning or, or whatever. But then even compounding it more was a feeling he was having a complete life reversal. Everything he'd been living for with such zeal, he realized now he, he, had, he had wasted that. And now he was going to serve what he had previously hated so much. It had to be very sobering for him. And you could see why he might respond in such a way as to not eat or drink for three days. So Saul's conversion was very dramatic, flash of light, meeting Jesus in person, all of this. In the introduction, we talked uh, about some unlikely people we, we knew who were saved. To help illustrate or apply this second point, you might share some of the most dramatic conversion stories you or your group have, have heard or experienced. One from history you can share is Martin Luther. I had a somewhat similar experience to uh, Saul's, although it took much longer. It did involve a flash of lightning. In July 1505, in, in what's now Germany, Luther was on horseback returning to college when lightning almost struck and killed him, but it did knock him from his horse, and he cried out, I'll become a monk! Uh, and, and so he did, but that, that whole process of trying to become right with God through the works of the church left him completely unsatisfied. He knew he was not saved through all these works. One day he'd gone to Rome. He was climbing the, the scale of Sancta, the, the holy stairs there that were supposedly where Pilate had stood to judge Christ and, and Christ had stood on them. And this would, in their ideas then, they thought that would give you a lot of credit with God for years out of purgatory. But suddenly the verse, the righteous shall live by faith, struck him. And God's Spirit used it to touch his heart. And Luther got up from those stairs, now justified by faith in Jesus Christ. So it was a quite a striking testimony, quite a dramatic testimony. You can share Luther's testimony or some other dramatic conversion story and uh, you and your group can share any that uh, they know as well. But at this point, I'm, I might ask my group to make it, this application even more personal here and share how did I personally come to meet Christ. And you might want to enlist somebody in advance to share their testimony, then open it up for others. You can be prepared to share. 
But it, it's important for our people to learn to share their testimony, their story of, of how they came to Christ, and uh, inviting them to share it in class might help them share it out in the world. And I'm, as I said, I'm going to share an ex uh, suggest an exercise at the end of this lesson that might help them all too. And God might use this to convict somebody in your class that they don't have a testimony. Uh, we, we had that happen in our church one time. It, it might end up leading them to Christ. But, but share these testimonies about how you all met Christ, just like Paul did on the Damascus Road. Ours, of course, are not going to be as dramatic as his, but it does not mean that they are any less real. The best test of our, uh, the reality of our testimony is, of course, the last point, our lives after we met Christ. How did we change? What, what has God done with us? And this will bring us to Paul's life after Christ or his calling in, in verses 15 and 16. But before we get to that, there's this, uh, a kind of a side story in verses 10 through 14 regarding Ananias. So that, that could be point three for you, Ananias calling uh, to serve. Verse 10 says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to a street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he's praying, and he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias come and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. So God tells Ananias in a vision to go to the street called Straight, ask about Saul, lay his hands on him and pray so that he might get his sight back. But what was Ananias' response? Uh, interesting, uh, but almost typical of, of us as God's followers. Verse 13, Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here uh, he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Uh, you might ask your group, can you understand why? Ananias might be hesitant. Uh, to me, you sure can. I mean, this man had been arresting and killing Christians, and now you want me to go over and over to where he's staying and pray for him? Uh, why don't you just ask me to stick my head in the lion's mouth or, or something, right? Uh, from a human standpoint, it, it was a difficult thing God was asking him to do, but we have to trust God knows what he's doing and go and do what he, what he tells us to do. He, he's going to use us when he sends us somewhere like that. And you might just, just flat out ask your group, does God sometimes call us as his people to do some difficult things? Of course, the answer is absolutely he does. And, and yeah, we often wrestle with God about these things, don't we? Like Moses, who said, Lord, I, I can't speak. Get, get somebody else. Gideon kept testing the Lord. Uh, we often give God reasons why we can't do what he's called us to do. And, and too many times, I'm afraid as church members, we decide whether we're going to do or not do something, some ministry or some activity set before us by how hard it is. If it's too hard, then we just think, oh, no, that, that, that's too hard. I'm not going to do it. But I think we, we need to, more often, we need to pray and ask God, Lord, is this something you are calling me to do? Not just is it hard or easy, but do you want me to do it? Because God does call us to do hard things with his help. And then again, you might share a time when God called you to do something that you didn't want to do or you were afraid to do or felt unable to. And ask your, ask your group members, can, can you all share a time? When, uh, when God asked you to do something you're afraid to do or, or felt challenged by, but, but, he, but he helped you to do it. Uh, for example, in, in my own life, a few, a few years ago, I went to witness to an unchurched family uh, where we had just found out that the wife had just come down with uh, cancer. It was a uh, terminal cancer. It was a very difficult uh, situation. I did not know these people very well at all. Uh, so I asked one of our new deacons to go with me. He told me later, he said, Brother Sean, I could tell you had your game face on. Uh, very difficult situation, but the Lord used us, and uh, miraculously, we were able to lead both the husband and wife to pray to receive Christ. It, it was difficult. I, as Mike said, I had my game face on, but God used us. You and your group can share stories at times, and God called you to do something difficult. You may or may not want to share about this, but maybe that's even your testimony about serving as a Sunday school teacher. Some of y'all have shared those stories with me. It's hard. Maybe this isn't, you don't feel like it's your gift, but, but God's using you, and uh, I'm grateful that he is. But, but just emphasize to your group, just like God called Ananias to go and do something difficult, sometimes he calls us. Uh, to do difficult things too, things for which we feel inadequate. Maybe God's calling some of your group members to do some uh, difficult thing, to go on a mission trip, to serve them in, in ministry in some challenging way. This passage reminds us that if we will go ahead and obey him, he will use us just like he did Ananias here. Then the point four, of course, we see Saul's calling after Christ in, in verses 15 and 16. 
But the Lord said to him, Go, for he's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So God tells Ananias here, Go, he's the Lord. We're to do the hard things he commands us to do. But he also shows him some of the plans he has for Saul. And again, you could either lecture on this or just ask your group, what all do you see in these verses about God's plan for Saul? Well, first of all, it says he is a chosen instrument. The word instrument here is a, is a Greek word, skuos, S-K-E-U-O-S, meaning a household vessel or utensil used for carrying liquid. It gives us a great picture of what God wants to do with us, right? We're vessels. Think of a pitcher uh, through a, 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 a liquid is poured out from it. Well, what's important, the pitcher or what's in it? Well, of course, it, it's what's in it that matters. The, the pitcher may be better or worse quality or whatever, but it's what's poured out through the pitcher that is really the important thing. So Paul writes in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, he says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will, will be of God and not from ourselves. Paul says there, we are not the treasure. Uh, we're just like vessels that God's treasure is poured out through to others through us. Every one of us as Christians need to see ourselves as a chosen vessel like Paul was through whom God is going to pour out his treasure to other people. And he may use uh, each of us in slightly different ways to do that. Some have one specific calling from God. Some have another. Uh, God shows us here in verse 15 what his specific plan for Saul was. It, it was to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. So Saul's call was to share the gospel primarily with the Gentiles. See that he emphasized that in Romans 1, 5, 11, 13, and in Galatians 2, 8. So that was his calling. But remember, this is, we're not just here to do a history lesson. Let's make sure that each of our members understands God's called us to be a vessel uh, for him in some specific way too. And so ask your group to consider, what's my calling? How does God want you to be used as a vessel to share Christ and his word with others? And remember, as we saw, he may ask you to do something difficult when he gives you his assignment. Now, you could either call this part point five or maybe just a lesson application that you could use at uh, a place in this lesson that God leads you to, but preparing your testimony. I think it should be a fantastic thing to do at some point in the lesson that God leads you to do this week. Uh, the Lord obviously felt Paul's testimony was important. He inspired Luke to share it, as we said, uh, pretty much in full three times in Acts here and then in 22, 3 through 21 and 26, 2 through 23. As I mentioned before, a good outline of a personal testimony is share your life before Christ, how you came to Christ, and then what your life has been like since you came to Christ. We've seen that outline lived out in Saul's life in this passage. I really think one of the best applications we can help our class members make this week is encourage them to write out your own personal testimony using this outline. My life before Christ, how I came to Christ, my life since Christ. What I have done is I made just a uh, little half sheet uh, handout. It's very simple uh, with, with uh, saying uh, at the top it says my story testimony outline with those three points under it. And just encourage them. Just write out in a sentence or two. My, my life before I came to Christ, how I came to Christ, my life since Christ. Maybe you've got, maybe you're going to have time in class Sunday to do that. Or you could give them, give it to them. Say, take this home. Uh, take some time uh, this Lord's Day afternoon to uh, spend some time in and just write out your testimony and challenge them to practice sharing it briefly. It doesn't have to be long, just one or two minutes, just in a natural way. And then pray and watch for opportunities to share it. This may be one of the best applications you can make with your group this week. And remember, uh, God may also use it to convict somebody in your class who doesn't have a testimony that they need him to be their Lord and Savior so that they will have a testimony and know salvation. The Apostles Paul's testimony is one of the most important stories in the whole Bible, shared three times in the book of Acts. But encourage your group that their testimonies are important too. God can use their stories to touch others just like he used Paul's. Well, I hope uh, some of this will be helpful to you. I hope there's something in here that you can use this week. Remember, if you'd like to read or print out a text version of this overview to uh, pr either print this whole thing out or get one of the quotes or stories or, or scripture references, whatever, you can get that on my blog at www.shawneethomas.com and I'll post that address in the comment section below. If you'll hit subscribe to this video, YouTube will automatically send you next week's and you won't have to search for it. And if you write anything in the comments below, I'll be sure to pray for you and for your group by name.
this week. For my licensing agreement with Lifeway, these weekly lessons are based on content from Explore the Bible Adult Resources. The presentation is my own. It has not been reviewed by Lifeway. Lifeway resources are available at goexplorethebible.com, goexplorethebible.com slash adults dash training. And if you have questions about Explore the Bible resources, you can send emails to explorethebible at lifeway.com.